um, was started through a grant by the uh, community table of Silva, which is our local uh, uh, soup kitchen type food bank and community gathering place where people can uh, get a meal. And um, the, it was started on land and is still run on land owned by the uh, retired OBGYN, Dr. Kwan Su Han, and we're very grateful for him allowing us to garden there. Um, the first year or so of the garden, uh, it was run as one big garden that uh, people came together altruistically and grew food and all the food was for donation, which in the springtime worked really well. And in the fall worked really well when it's cool outside and uh, a lot of fun to be out in the garden. But during the hot buggy summertime, mm. when the weeds grow this tall, uh, it kind of devolved into just one, two or three people mm. running the the project and it can't really work that way and so um it's like a little red hen syndrome a little red hen syndrome right. you, yeah <laughs> and so uh, about 13 years ago they decided to um uh, uh plow it up and then divide up the property into small plots or what we call allotment plots mm -hmm. where people from the community can come and adopt um a plot and uh so that i was um I was in my uh, uh, second semester of horticulture school at Haywood Community College over in the next county, and I read a little blurb in the Smoky Mountain News about the uh, community garden giving away on, uh, a garden space and an organic garden, so I was pretty excited about getting to put into practice some things I was learning and uh, try to grow my own vegetables, and I went down and to the meeting and adopted a plot and had no idea it would change my life in the way that it did and mm -hmm. really um is one of the best decisions i ever made was joining that garden and i've been a member there now for this is our 13th season so you said the food was for donation so all the food that was grown there was given to the community table is that basically uh, originally all the food that was grown there was given to the community table the way it works now um and we actually uh when we built the Cullowee community garden which is a project um, very similar, but on, a, on county owned land instead of privately owned land. Um, we replicated the model of the Silva Garden. So both gardens work uh, the same way, which is we provide space um, to people from the community. Anybody is welcome to come join us and adopt a plot. Our garden sizes are 15 feet by 30 feet for a full size plot, which is ample room to grow um, all the vegetables a family would need. Um, we provide tools, equipment, materials, fertilizers, compost, mulches, um, everything but seeds and plants. Where does all that come from? Well, we keep tools on site. Um, we get, uh, we have a very small operating budget. I think the Silva Garden on average is about five or $600 a year. And who, that's just from people donating it or the, Correct. Or the county uh, funds it? The Silva Garden is private. Mm -hmm. The Cullowee Garden is county supported and county funded. Oh, that's very nice. Okay. Um, and has been, and we'll talk about that. We'll tell the story of that. Okay. Um, but so we provide all the tools, equipment, materials, and everything except seeds and plants. Um, but we do get donations of those throughout the year. And then um, instead of charging anybody an adoption fee, for their garden space, we charge everybody half of their produce. And that goes where? And we collect that food and donate it into local food relief here in the community. Um, our primary donation spot is the community table. We also donate food to uh, United Christian Ministries and the market up in Cullowee, which is next to the Point Coffee Shop. Mm -hmm. um, they are a Mana Food Distribution Center and also a little a uh, small grocery that sells uh, discounted and very cheap food at or just past um, expiration date. So if you haven't found that place, go check out the market, save some money. Um, and we also allow our gardeners to donate to families and individuals that they may know who need some help. And then we allow our gardeners, if they are in need themselves or receiving services, we allow them to donate to themselves because it makes no sense to take a box of food to the back of a building 
and then walk around to the front of the building and say, hi, can I have some food? Mostly what we want to do is have people growing food for themselves, their friends and family, and also have the idea of sharing and giving food away mm -hmm. for free into the community um, to help uh, alleviate some of the food insecurity and to provide fresh, organic produce, um, nutrient dense and local into the community because there's a lot of uh, organic food access. There's organic food access, but usually it is for those who have the financial means to be able to afford it. Right. So we like that. And all the, both the gardens are managed using organic cultural methods. It's, it seems to me like there's, there's some benefit in just um, putting that idea out there and for people to be practicing growing their own food yes and, and and not shipping it from california or chile or mm -hmm. mexico uh but but having people you know it saves energy it's good for the environment it uh, certainly is and and uh and and the, it's important for a region to be self-sufficient in in growing its own food and it's something that we're letting slip away from us in this modern world you know, and we're so dependent on fossil fuels, and and um, and and we we tend to believe that that system is sustainable and can continue forever. But I think we're sp we're starting to some of us are starting to realize that it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, that sooner or later we're going to run out of fossil fuels, and and um, it makes so much more sense uh, to avoid catastrophe <laughs> to, to learn how to sustain ourselves by growing our own food in every part of the country but but sure. here in the south I mean I mean we're so capable of doing that we have a long growing season we we uh, are totally capable but there's very the farms are disappearing mm. in, in uh, North Carolina you know being replaced by development and industry Correct. And here in Jackson County, we're, we don't have a large amount of flat arable land compared even with our neighboring counties yeah. um, for agriculture. And those um, large flat areas along the creeks and rivers, um, we've been successfully growing trailer parks and fast food restaurants <laughs> and auto parts stores, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily food. So you're right. I, I mean, Growing food and donating food is only one of the missions of uh, the Silva and Cullowee Community Gardens um, here. Uh, I work with a state nonprofit called North Carolina Community Garden Partners, which is a collective of, um, uh, uh, we advocate and support and do policy work for in support of community gardens throughout the state. And one of our catchphrases is, that we grow gardens and we grow community. Mm -hmm. And it's very true. I, I have friends that I may never have met uh, if it wasn't for us gardening together in community. Um, the sustainability factors are very high. Um, you know, growing food together is community resiliency. Yeah. Um, knowing your neighbors in times of trouble is one of the most important things we can do, knowing how to grow food. So one of the things that our gardens are able to do is provide a safe learning environment for people who want to learn how to garden or who know how to garden but have never gardened organically using organic methods. So they are able to come in there and have some support through my help as well as our other knowledgeable garden members. Yeah. And then, uh, um, in my, you know, my, two of my passions are organic community garden organizing and also the native plants and flora of the Southern Appalachians. And so with the uh, both gardens, I'm able to marry those two together because um, in organic agriculture and organic gardening, flowers are uh, very, native flowers, especially shrubs and trees are very important for attracting not only pollinating insects, but predator insects mm -hmm. and keeping, uh, um, producing an ecosystem 
and within the garden that allows for um, not reacting to stuff but providing an ecosystem to where pests aren't um, just able to flourish mm -hmm. so uh, we, we you know when the when the mountain mint is in flower at the front of both gardens it is loaded up with uh, uh, butterflies and moths and mm -hmm. Bees and wasps and hornets and all manner of critters on it's it. It's a very biodiverse uh, situation or, or uh, That's environment. Right. Uh, but something you, I just want to step back a little bit. I mean, you talked about it bringing the community together. Really, yes. gardening I mean, is something that cuts across the political spectrum. There are Democrats and Republicans That's right. that garden. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter whether you're garden a liberal together, or, right? or a conservative. Everybody is working together, sure. uh, doing the same thing. It, it sort of uh, belies our differences when we realize a garden makes us understand that we all rely on the same things to survive on this earth regardless what our political philosophy mm. may be and what our religion is or our orientation you know uh, that that um, we all have these things in common and, and uh, this is one place where the whole community can work together and and, mm. and, and, and so what type of participation is there in the community garden do you have a large group of people now that are involved I mean throughout the season mm -hmm. um, and and uh, do, do you find that there is this diversity in the community that that comes together over the community garden and, and, and w what type of uh, are, are there elements of, uh, of um, ad adversity within the garden about ph <laughs> philosophy about what what can be done what can't be done in the community garden are there some people who want to use chemicals and sprays and others that strongly resist that. I mean, tell me about that a little bit. Sure. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> to all Short those questions. <laughs> um, it, uh, in general, the, the gardens can be seen as a microcosm of society. And you would be surprised at the politic and relationship uh, building and devolving or other things. But there are, it is. It is people having to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, conflict resolution is a part of it. Um, there's a lot of it, but uh, you know, it's a it is a microcosm of society in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mostly the good sides of it, but there are also um, other things that happen in it. Um, as to diversity, I recently ran the uh, numbers for the um, demographics in the Kulawik Mean Garden, and came back, and we have one demographic. Mm -hmm. Gardeners. <laughs> I don't care where anybody comes from. Mm -hmm. Before they get there, they pull up into the parking lot and walk down a slope into the garden, stick their hands into the soil, and they are gardening, and we are gardening, and gardening together. And um, diversity is the only thing that allows life on this earth to continue. Mm -hmm. That um, an 18 average 18 inches of soil across the earth sunlight and the fact that it rains mm -hmm. um, and diversity and so in a garden setting a community garden especially diversity of people diversity of ideas diversity of cultures diversity of plants flowers shrubs trees um, diversity of produce types and things that we're growing and diversity of in the soil where it all really happens and the soil microbes and the critters are the most important things for me and so um, it is a very very um, diverse and active gardens um, this year our garden participation has been just um, really invigorating and and the energy it's giving back to those of us who have been parts of this silver garden for a long time mm -hmm. we have um, uh, of the two gardens, the Cullowy Garden and the Silva Garden, we currently have one plot that is open and available for adoption. Mm. And so we have 19 garden spaces in Silva, and 18 of 19 are adopted and being actively run. And then in Cullowy, we have 32 spaces, and all 32 are adopted. Amazing. And um, it is. And in fact, we've had, we have turnover every year. So, um, People uh, join the garden 
in the springtime when it's nice out and they've been cooped up all winter and they want to get out and do some stuff and then it gets hot and buggy and that's hard work and uh so maybe they uh it, they don't stay with it or life happens as it does to all of us and and other circumstances cause them to leave or they move out but for whatever reasons every year we get turnover and this year every time a plot or two has come open next thing you know somebody has come and said i would like to adopt this garden so, so how, how do people do that is there do you have a list that that uh, people can see on the internet or or uh how do people know how do people become part of the community garden um there's no sign up there's just show up that's one of my little <laughs> catchphrases i use for the uh our uh, student volunteers at Western, when they contact me, how do I sign up? Mm -hmm. But um, we maintain, both gardens, we maintain Facebook pages for that online presence. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no like list of online, you know, there's uh, no waiting lists um, because we have yet to have every plot adopted and a bunch of people wanting to join. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited for when that happens because it means you know, maybe we could put more gardens in other places. Um, there's a two-stage process. One is bureaucratic, mm -hmm. administrative. <laughs> so we have um, applications that people fill out. And uh, so they contact us at silvacommunitygarden at gmail.com or adambigelow at jacksonnc.org. Um, and so silvacommunitygarden at gmail.com send an email to me i will send you back an application at some point um you fill that out and then you're approved and you're part of the garden but that is the administrative bureaucratic the real way people adopt plots mm -hmm. is you show up to one of our uh weekly work days and in the colorway community garden which is located on south painter road in colorway we host garden work days volunteer work days where anybody can come and help us do the work to keep the whole garden running, maintaining pathways. Um, I turn compost, weeding flower beds, different things like that. Um, I host work days in Cullowee every Wednesday afternoon from three o'clock until dusk, which right now is about nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. You don't have to come for the whole time. You can come for five minutes, you can come for an hour, you can come by yourself or you can bring a group or you can bring your whole group and please bring your group. I could use some help in the summertime when the <laughs> college students are gone and I have a lot of work to do. So Wednesday afternoons in Cullowee, also Saturday mornings in Cullowee from 9 a.m. to noon. And this is every week, all year long, including the winter in Cullowee. We're out there doing the work that uh, keeps the garden running and without the volunteer help, um, the Cullowee Community Garden wouldn't, wouldn't be where it is today. Um, last year in the garden, we hosted uh, 613 volunteers. Uh, wow. I know, I know. Wow, indeed, 613 people. That's an people. enormous amount of people for a community this size. I, I agree. And most of them were from Western Carolina University, uh -huh. um, but not all. And um, that isn't uh, 613 different people. That's just the total number. I tracked oh. the number. Okay. So if you come five times, you count as five people. <laughs> you know. But if only um, the elections work that way. Right? <laughs> thankfully, they don't. Um, participation in the elections is really our limiting factor, y'all. Yeah. For real, like 20%. We celebrate that. Anyway, uh, and so um, come to those volunteer work days in Cullowee. We also host volunteers every Thursday afternoon in the Silva Community Garden on, in downtown Silva. Um, sunny, beautiful downtown Silva. Um, every week from 3 o'clock until dusk. And if you are interested in joining and adopting a plot, then you show up. I, you say, I want to adopt a plot. I point out the available plots that are open for adoption. And I say, this one's open. And you say, yes, I would like to adopt that. And I get really excited and I shake your hand and welcome you. And it's yours. And you get to start right away if you want to. It's really cool. Yep. 
So, uh, so you're a uh, a county employee. Correct. It, it, tell it, very, very excited about that. <laughs> so the Cullowee Community Garden is a project that um, uh, began with a vision that I had one hot summer day in the Silva Community Garden. Um, I was out there working by myself. I was sweaty. The bugs were eating me. The weeds were taller than me. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I looked around and I just said, I, I love this work. I want to, I want to do this. I want to do this on a large scale. So I started developing this, uh, what in the big picture is a garden based environmental education project. Yeah. Um, but because of limitations, including land tenure, we don't own the land in Silva, nor do we have any written agreement or any, anything. So, uh, uh, I started looking for and thinking about using municipal land, land owned by all of us, the commons, to do a project like this. Um, I see a lot of county and town government and locally owned land, government land, that the only time anybody is on this pieces of land, and this is stuff around schools and around municipal buildings, is when they are mowing or weed eating them. That's the only time people walk on them. Um, Other than that, they're just growing grass for no reason. Um, And they could be growing food Hmm. in the form of community gardens and also fruit trees, shrubs and bushes and stuff like that. So um, I got together, uh, had a bunch of help with some friends and including um, uh, a friend, Anna Lippard, who works for the Jackson County Department of Public Health at the time. She was in charge of um, uh, health education and she brought the idea um, that I was working on to the health director at the time, uh, Paula Carden. Um, and somehow Paula said yes. And talking with her later, she said, oh, that was an easy yes. I never thought y'all would be able to put it, pull it off. <laughs> and so we did i went um prior to that step i actually went to newly elected county commissioner head jack deadman at the time Mm -hmm. who was part of the uh um, tea party surge that uh was elected to the jackson county commissioners and here i was you know uh uh, I just, I mean, I put on shoes right before walking into his place. I'm, you know, obviously a left leaning person. I work in organic community gardens, whatever. But so I went to Jack and pitched this idea, fully expecting to get laughed out of there. Um, cause I didn't know Mr. Deadman at all. But when I got to the point of, uh, in my pitch that I think there's some available municipal land that we could do a project on. Without hesitation, he reached over his shoulder, pulled out a map, and said, here's 5.2 acres in Cullowee. If you get a project together, I'll support it. Mm-hmm. And from, uh, the, mm-hmm. from the time where I had that vision to giving out the first garden plots in Cullowee was an eight-year-long process. Wow. And, um, and it is, uh, it's become my life and my heart's work um, managing the community gardens. And I'm not the best organic gardener that you know um and i'm not the best community organizer and the best landscaper or designer or any of these things but um somehow we're able to bring people together in community partnerships that have made this project when there's a will the way <laughs> that's right and i believe in it in the work and i believe in its cascading benefits out into the community and the general public as well as the ecological benefits Mm -hmm. and the environmental benefits that go along with how we approach things. Um, And so uh, the garden is currently managed and run through the health department. Um, It was started originally with a uh, grant. Really? Yeah. And I love that relationship Mm. because that makes our garden a garden for the public health. And I love saying that phrase, a garden for the public health. It is just a beautiful image. Um, it, it matches the health department's mission completely. So, so did you somehow convince somebody in, in the county government to create a position for you? 
Did you take over an existing? There was no position? existing position. So running you created your guns. own job and sold it to the county, basically as a necessary um, position. Uh, the county, uh, yes, in a way. I mean, the county and uh, the health department um, saw that this garden project matches their core missions: um, healthy eating, healthy activity environmental health community health and all these things match up um we uh and advocates within the the county health department including paula carden and my supervisors um pushed for and and wanted this to become a part of the work that we do and so that is how um i am a county employee i have a badge Jackson County <laughs> Department great. of Public Health. It says Adam Bigelow, Community Garden Manager on it. My real job title with the state is health educator, and I'm in the health education. With with the state, you uh, said? As far as, like, state classification. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, classified, because there's but no... You get paid your salary from the county. Correct, yeah. correct. And I'm a half-time, year-round, half-time salaried employee of the health department. Um, which uh, is great and also uh, it makes it to where I'm not just doing community gardens for my work uh, and my income I have to uh, go out into the world and do other kind of work too <laughs> but um, you have a real life <laughs> well you could say that I don't know if, if my other work is just, actually truly real it. or not uh, I'll let you know in a couple of years but um, what, what what is that? What are you doing uh, with the rest of your time? With the uh, rest of my time, I've actually started an ecotourism business, um, where it's called Bigelow's Botanical Excursions. Oh, <laughs> um, and pretty soon you'll be able to go to Bigelow'sBotanicalExcursions.com and mm -hmm. find out all about it. But currently, I'm just maintaining a Facebook presence with that one too. Mm -hmm. um, that's Facebook slash Bigelow's Botanical Excursions. <laughs> uh, and uh, what that is is, uh, is where I, um, I'm a plant nerd. I am a uh, self-identify as a plant nerd. Mm -hmm. And I'm part of a community of plant nerds that are out there in the world. Um, and in this business, what it is, um, I offer a guided service. Mm -hmm. that I will take you for a walk in the woods, identify the flowers, plants, shrubs, and trees that we see growing around us, oh, and share their stories. Um, and that's really the things that really capture me and got me in were the stories of plants. Um, my, I grew yeah, up in a library. Example, yeah. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a library. I'm the son of a children's librarian, and it is a story that really captures us. Um, one of the first stories that I heard, so stories can be about the edible or medicinal use of a plant, mm -hmm. uh, which I consider ethnocentricism a little bit, if that's all you want to know about is, can you eat this? Can you eat that? You know, that's great and all, but we're not the only critters out there. So mm -hmm. um, stories can be about the ecology, be that a, a relationship with an insect, or stories can be about history, American history, um, uh, or uh, the history of botany itself. What great explorer, botanical explorer from Europe came over to the Americas that this plant is named for, or who did it? Ginseng. American ginseng is one of the uh, most known wild plants out in the woods for um, wild harvesting. And uh, we are very close to depleting it completely from the woods. It is used, uh, that's a uh, Panax quinquefolia if you're taking those at home. That <laughs> uh, is uh, being over harvested, especially when the price per dried weight goes up. Um, and it is uh, one of the poster childs for conservation in the woods. It is used as a uh, what's called an adaptogen in herbal medicine, which um, doesn't have uh, necessarily like direct uh, 
like you get a sore and you put ginseng on it or anything like that but it, it is said to help you adapt to changes or stresses and also to help other herbs work better and it is mostly sent to asia it is very very popular in chinese herbal medicine um, but there's a lot of plants you know um our trillium species um which you know is one of the iconic wildflowers of southern appalachia so much so that people like to like uh clear out acres of land to build a, a high-end gated community second home development out in the woods killing all kinds of trillium and then name the development after the plant that they killed that's one of our patterns out there um you know who i'm talking about trillium anyway um uh beth root is one of the common names for one of the trillium species and i was watching a uh, video by a former a uh, root digger in West Virginia who's now a plant activist that was uh, sh uh, shared by the uh, United Plant Savers, a really great organization that is trying to protect the diversity of the forest. Um, and mentioning that the trillium root was, you know, going for like a dollar eighty-seven a dried pound. And if you've ever, the trillium root is very small on its own and then you dry it and it weighs hardly nothing and you get a pound of that is a whole bunch of trillium and then that's only a dollar 87 mm. and then so people Life are working cheap, huh? all day long digging and then all night long drying so that it meets the standards mm. to get hundreds of pounds mm. for you know less than minimum wage in in some of the poor Appalachian communities mm. and so that's a really big issue but it's not all doom and gloom there's a lot of good fun things about um, uh, plants and their stories and uh, so uh, ginseng and trillium and some of the herbal medicines are one but you know there's some things that are uh, um, not they don't have anything really to do with uh, um, people's use anymore but maybe have a historical use so there's a shining club moss a lot of people don't know about club mosses they are a uh, fern ally they're a little small um, plant there's uh, so shining club moss also turkey foot is a uh, uh, ground running ground cedar these are things out in the woods and they don't produce by reproduce by uh, flowers and seeds they reproduce more like ferns where they put out spores the shining club moss is directly related with nightclubs and discotheques <laughs> i'll show what it's true and this is the story that really one of the original stories i heard that really pulled me in um, so the shining club moss puts up a structure that releases spores to spread itself around like uh, seeds being sent out. Those spores are on a structure that is botanically termed a strobulus or stroboli, and um, those spores go off. And somewhere, somehow, and I have no idea that, that how this happened, somebody realized that those tiny spores, and they are, when they get brushed up against and go off and they are the size of dust motes they are just little dust but somebody realized that they were flammable and they are flammable you can go when they're sporulating light a match or a lighter next to it and then pluck it and the spores will go through the flame and go tick, tick, tick. Mm. and so um somewhere so i mean again somehow somebody realized that this was a flammable thing and People went out into the woods at the time of year when they were sporulating and collected massive amounts of this, um, these spores from the shining club moss and other lycopodiums in the Lycopodiaceae family and collected it and sent it off to um, fancy people who were playing with this new technology called photography. And they put it, they would use this powder put it onto a plate and ignite it to produce the flash the phosphorus that is that it's not phosphorus it's not phosphorus it's spores 
from the Lycopodiums, oh, or what they've been renamed. Anyway, so it became the flash powder mm. for early flash photography. And because the structure of the plants that produce the spores is called a strobulus, these became known as strobe lights. How interesting. And so the strobe light uh, and strobe effect of the disco <laughs> that sent me into a seizure. That derived originally from. Derived originally uh. from the strobulus or the botanical part of that plant. And That's I love story. sharing that story uh -huh. out in the woods by pointing at this plant and say, this plant is directly related with disco text. It's a lot of fun. And that is just one of so many wonderful stories and mm -hmm. tales that really, so that with my business, um, Bigelow's Botanical Excursions, uh, with that business, uh, I'm able to do one of my real life missions, which is, and which happens in both the gardens and in my eco tours and that is to try to connect people with nature so that they will fall in love with it so that when someone says we need to protect this thing called nature they understand maybe more what we're talking about um, there's lots of guide services around in western north carolina that will take you on a hike to a great view or to a waterfall and maybe know a few of the flowers and plants along the way but with Bigelow's Botanical Excursions, the wildflowers are the destination. Mm -hmm. And we do go to waterfalls, we do go to great views, but it is the trip along the way, the journey along the way, slow, gentle, easy walks in the woods. Before I learned wildflowers, I would be just trucking along as fast as I can move in the woods, trying to get to that place and then get back out. Um, once I was shown the flowers and I became aware of this world all around us, my walks now are slow, methodical, I don't want to miss anything, and it takes a long time. So one of the places I like to go is Panther Town Valley. Oh, Beautiful place. Um, I recommend everybody go visit Panther Town Valley and then go home, go onto the internet and give some money to the friends of Panther Town who helped to run it. But if you've been there and you park at Salt Rock parking lot mm -hmm. off that, of Breedlove Road, that's the main parking area. That That's uh, off 64, right? And you come off 64 and up Cedar Valley Road. And right. um, yep. And uh, so you park at the parking lot and then you walk out to the very first overlook, which is called Salt Rock. Mm -hmm. And it is a granitic dome, Pluton outcropping again if you want to know what the heck i just said and what all that means come on one of our eco tours and we'll uh i'll explain <laughs> all about it uh, if you just hike it normally that's just the very beginning and the very first overlook you get to and it shouldn't take you more than 15 minutes on one of our walks on one on a plant walk it could be an hour to get to that point oh okay and so uh Anybody who's ever hiked at Panther Town is probably laughing right now. So you're doing this on a, uh, like a regular basis or after you gather a certain number of people, then you do it? I mean, how, how does that work? Yeah, uh, both of that. So what I do is I offer um, a weekly class that I, I call it a class. It's a wildflower walk. There's no tests, um, no quizzes, no homework, <laughs> except you will be seeing flowers everywhere you go because they are all around us. Um, and I'll offer them in six week sessions. So um, they run from April through October. And in fact, our next six week session is starting up next Monday um, and will run through September. Mm -hmm. um, it costs $150 for the six week class per person, which only works out to $25 a week. Mm -hmm. um, and we meet at a different trailhead every week and go for a hike. It's from 9 a.m. until 1. Often it runs later because oh, great I get to run in my, my mouth. And so for six weeks, you get to meet other people, um, get to know people over that time of six weeks, and experience a lot of the glory and splendor of, of Western North Carolina. And it's all based around us here in Jackson County. I go to Macon County. I go to Haywood County. I go a little bit to Swain. 
Um, but we go up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. We go to public and private gardens that I have friends that were relations with, including the Highlands Biological Station in Highlands, the Cornell Bryan Native Plant Garden in Lake Jonaluska, which is a hidden treasure. Mm. Um, every spring, we go to Dr. Dan Patillo, retired botanist from WC. We go to his private garden at his house um, and walk around. And uh, I identify the flowers. I teach you how to identify the flowers and plants. And I tell the stories and we go for a walk. Um, so that's uh, 150 for the whole six week session. Or you can come to any individual walk on any Monday for only $40 for the day. And then I'm also available for groups and individuals and organizations to hire on other days of the week for half day and full day walks. And my rates are very reasonable, um, especially if you get 10, 15 people together. Mm -hmm. um, and these can be walks out at places I know that are going to be wonderfully filled with flowers at that time of year, or even um, I'll come out to your property and walk your property with you uh, and tell you the plants growing around. A lot of people would like to know what's going on there, Lynn. Yeah. A lot of people would like to know, and a lot of people are interested more and more, especially with the foraging and medicinal, but a lot of people would like to know what is growing on their land, what is not and um so those you know that's um the services i offer and uh, uh i'm also really interested in connecting with school groups and homeschool groups yeah. and different people to do this as part of um their education and i would give a, a highly discounted rate to any uh public school or homeschool organization or group that wants to get like together you love to do anyway uh, you know it started with me just being out in the woods accosting strangers <laughs> hey come over here you got to see this plant and they're like why is this person talking to me but uh, adam is is an even more complex uh person than <laughs> is being portrayed here because uh he, he happens to be a uh an amazing musician as well oh, thank he, you. he is uh a highly skilled uh classic bass player that's right uh and i mean he plays the big bass fiddle you know i'm a stand-up guy and i play a stand-up stand -up guy right and um and i since i've known adam he's been involved in several bands and uh and he's in high demand um for you know for playing music as well talk a little bit about that i the first the first time i saw it, i think it was uh, smoky mountain drum and bass no 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 that's ian i wasn't a part of that i was oh, a fan of okay. that group yeah. Um, but I, um, yeah, thank you. I've been playing bass for a long time now and, uh, I guess 20 plus years. And, uh, um, where did you learn to play bass? I learned by listening. You uh, never took lessons? No, no lessons. And I didn't buy my first bass, That's an electric amazing. bass. That's not an easy instrument. Until, uh, well, it's easy to start, but not easy to, uh, you know, it's really like, so if a guitar player is cording a chord on the guitar which can be all complicated yeah. i just gotta see which is the top note that you're pressing down on and then i press that at the same time and that's it that's the secret <laughs> bass lessons with bigelow just happened right there <laughs> um, just watch not the guitar so players simple folks, yeah. um uh, so i bought my first bass at 27 years old an electric bass and started learning you mean just a bass guitar yeah electric bass yeah. guitar and then about four or five years later, I held a stand-up, an upright bass for the first time. And just, I'm a big guy. It's a big instrument. Yeah, but I that's a difficult, like I mean, it doesn't have frets, right? It, it, uh, fret, to fret is a uh, word in English language that means to have unnecessary worry. <laughs> and so I play a fretless instrument, which means without worries, unnecessary but worries. That's, that's very, you have to be very skillful to do that. Uh, it's the, I, I just, the very first time I held one, I was home. Hmm. And uh, I've been a fan of music my whole life and uh, went to lots of concerts. And um, I started finding that the... You know, a lot of most people, when they listen to music, they hear the vocalists, they hear the lead instruments, guitars or pianos or whatever, 
and I always heard that bass line coming out. So it's just something that I've just fell in love with and, and do. Um, and I've been playing my very first, my very first band was a college band at Western that we called ourselves Mayor Presley and we played one uh, fraternity house one time and that was our, that was our extent. <laughs> and then my, very, my second band I joined um, when I lived in Franklin briefly um, and we were called Cooking with Quanta and we played out for over a decade, uh, electric rock and roll band, original music. Yeah. And all, all the members of that band are still my friends and my brothers. Um, and then uh, I, uh, s a friend of mine took me down to this Tuesday night old time jam that started out at Spring Street Cafe, mm. or really is, or what's now City Lights, but in that right. location. Spring Street when Faye Holiday was doing it. And there was Ian Moore playing fiddle, who's a character. Great, great. Amazing player and historian of the music. And then uh, retired psychology professor, Dr. Hal Herzog She's on guitar. Right. He's over in Weaverville. Oh, okay. And they had been doing this Tuesday night thing for about five years. And I showed up, and Hal denies this to this day, but I showed up. And I wasn't as good as I am now, for sure, then. Um, and I started playing, and at one point during the night, Hal leans over to me and says, uh, boy, when you, when you don't know a song, you sure do play it loud. <laughs> and I left that night, and I didn't come back to the Tuesday night session for about six months. I was, mm. I was like, her. And uh, also, I was challenged to get better. But I did come back, and I ended up coming back every week on Tuesday nights for over 10 years. Mm. And um, it was that, I think that really, all that combined, but that weekly Tuesday night, not knowing these old time and swing and old blues songs that they were playing and country tunes and all that, but just having to pick it up by ear, um, that really helped make me into the player I am now. Mm. And uh, currently playing a really fun, um, acoustic band, uh, bluegrassy, newgrassy, Americana, whatever label a band called Old Dirty Bathtub. Good group. They play. You play it. Uh, no, no name, right? O often. No, we don't play. Uh, we have played at No Name yeah. and other places. We play our. Uh, Recently, we played uh, one of the concerts on the creek in Silva, yeah, I and there. I saw you dancing. I was there. I saw Abram was dancing. Couldn't help but dance. It I know. It was a lot of fun. And uh, our next booked gig, I think, is August 12th at a loft in Asheville, the rooftop pool bar. So we get to play a pool party. I'm going swimming. I don't know about the rest of the guys. <laughs> uh, and we're available for how you can find us at uh, Facebook slash Old Dirty Bathtub. Yeah. And that's O-L apostrophe, o -L apostrophe. for anybody I who's I, I was busted for putting the D in. Yep, no D, yeah. no E, yeah. just apostrophe. And if anybody's a fan of old school 90s hip hop, especially the Wu-Tang Clan, mm -hmm. uh, oh, we modeled our name after Old Dirty, ba uh. old dirty Bastard. Ah, <laughs> okay, the, okay. Well, that's but, a uh, old dirty derivation bath, of that. We don't do any bluegrass covers of Wu-Tang songs, I promise. None of that. None of that. <laughs> but Old Dirty Bathtub did play a benefit concert for the Canary Coalition. That's right. Back in uh, April. That's correct. At the Mad Batter. And Had a great time and doing that. And Always happy to help out good organizations. Grateful for that. Mm -hmm. That was excellent. Then everybody enjoyed it. And we, in fact, made a video out of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, and I support the work of the Canary Coalition and uh, I mean I'm a I'm an environmental activist both actively out there advocating for the things I do mm -hmm. um, and in the work I do and in my daily life and the attempts my attempts to tread lightly on the earth and so uh, I've been a big supporter of you and your work for a long time and uh, I appreciate um, that I think uh, you know everybody out listening and watching this video knows or should know how uh, incredible of an activist and, and person you are. Um, years ago, my band Cooking with Quana played a, a benefit for you guys out at, um, in Asheville in a parking lot. It was the, uh, 
Uh, and um, was that the end of the relay? It was the end air? of the relay for clean air. Right. And um, I tell this story on you, and uh, you, you may not know this. I've told you before, but you are one of my personal heroes out there in the world, and I'm not just blowing smoke. I tell this story, and it really is something I brought into my daily practice. So um, I had all these expectations built up from seeing images of 60s marches, 1960s marches and all this stuff, of this relay for clean air. Uh, people are going to come marching up the street, and there's going to be hundreds of people and <laughs> singing and chanting. And uh, so we're waiting around in the parking lot with all the booths set up, and my band was going to play this event. And I hear, here they come. And so we go out in the parking lot and look up the street. And here comes like 15 people <laughs> walking, holding um, the, the banner. Mm -hmm. And everybody's excited. But, you know, this I, my expectation was like hundreds of people. But well, we were hoping they would be. But, yeah. <laughs> but we do what we do, right? right. And, um, and so later at the end of the night, when things were wrapping up, um, I came up to you and asked you, um, I said, you know, and I kind of said, you know, I was expecting more people. How do you not get discouraged? Mm -hmm. And without hesitation, you hit your fist on the table and said, discouraged, <laughs> discouraged. I win victories, man. <laughs> I win victories. And, you know, really like I took that to heart mm -hmm. because I do a lot of, I do, um, host volunteer efforts mm -hmm. and, um, it, both the community, both the community gardens, as well as I do uh, trash cleanups, um, and uh, uh, we'll be getting another one organized pretty soon through the Tuck CG Trash Mob on Facebook. This is like one big commercial for Facebook or something, but uh, you know it is what it is. But uh, Tuck CG Trash Mob, you can find out how you can come help us pick up litter, and uh, so I host these volunteer efforts. And when I first started doing them, I would have expectations of 20, 30 people coming and helping me pick up litter or uh, pull weeds in a garden. Like I had expectations of hundreds of people coming on that march. And I would be disappointed when two or three or five people came. And after and through the process of talking with you and then bringing that home and, and milling around on it, I realized that I was doing a disservice to the people who showed up mm. by expecting more mm -hmm. and being disappointed when only two or three came. So I've flipped that. And now when I host any volunteer effort, any trash cleanup, anything to do with uh, the gardens on volunteer work days, I expect, I expect nobody to come. Mm -hmm. That way when one person shows up, it's victory. And that way when Days like um, two Earth Days ago when 75 people came through the Cullowee Community Garden that one day. I am just like ecstatic. And, and you know, expectations really has a lot to do with it. And, That's right. And I think something that many people disregard or don't understand and realize is the power of one person. The power of one person. And, and then how that is multiplied by two and three, you know, the, right. the, the, the sum is greater than the whole. You know, it's a, it's a process that Buckminster Fuller called synergy. That's right. And, and uh, when, when you build up three or four people, when you have a hundred people, it's immensely powerful. It's immensely powerful. But, but something, I mean, our, our admiration is completely mutual, Adam. You know, in, in, in the way you live your life, uh, and it's such a, a lesson to other people. You know, whatever you choose to do in life uh, is always based on, on your conscience and what you feel needs to be done. And you, you are an example in that uh, you you do what you feel needs to be done and and self-sustenance is secondary mm -hmm. so it seems to me you know mm -hmm. and, and um unfortunately my mom would like it if i had health insurance but, but you have faith that your self-sustenance will take care of itself if you do the right thing that's right and so you've built your life everything you do is something that you do for the world for the community yeah and and uh, at, 
and thank you and as a result that sustains you mm -hmm. and i like to think i live my life in the, in the same way but maybe not as as much even as you do and 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 uh, i think that's a great lesson in life you know there's so many people who work nine to five jobs hating what they do right and then they say well i'll start my life when my work day ends right and and i want to say to everybody who's out there don't do that don't do that do what you see needs to be done what you want to do what you have a passion to do yep. and have faith that the world the universe will take care of you yes and and when you do that because you are performing a necessary function and then you won't hate life you'll you'll begin to love life i agree and um and it's not always easy and let me qualify that statement because i agree with everything you said and i appreciate it but it is also in our culture and our system white male privilege does allow me some affording some of that luxury to be able to do those things also um uh i don't have children to raise so you know there's sacrifices people make for their children and stuff but even in everything if you find what you love to do and then you can incorporate that into every work and aspect imagine if everybody out there realized that every job that is being done can be an environmental environmental activist job you know even a server at a restaurant you can not give a straw to every table that comes up whether they want to use it or not and then you save all those straws little things add up so yeah. um, but definitely i am i feel uh lucky and and grateful to the community that um uh, that supports the work that I do and and wants to know more and I try to give back as much as possible It's all selfish. It's selfish altruism <laughs> So it's all I do it all for me But what I've realized is that the best thing for me is to have this strong healthy vibrant um, Sustainable community mm -hmm. around us and so I try to do everything I can to work towards that um, If all these people that you see walking around outside the window here behind us um if they uh would realize that you know their efforts their efforts in this march that they're on right now is having an effect no matter how small so many people don't do anything because they can't do everything that they mm. feel like needs to be done and i say start small you know my environmental activism started with not going through the drive through of fast food restaurants and not putting a straw into my cup. <laughs> now, you know, that was when I was 17. Now I look back going, why are you going to a fast food restaurant? <laughs> Period, you know, but you know, at the time I was like, I'm saving the earth and yeah. really I was, but we need, we need all of us. We need all of our help and uh, uh, definitely get out there and do, and even if it's going to, uh, the Canary Coalition dot org is that right or Canary Coalition? Canary Coalition dot org. Mm -hmm. Clicking on the PayPal link to donate. Mm -hmm. Give this man money because he's not accepting uh, money from uh, Duke Energy or uh, um, any of the oil and coal companies and um, or Monsanto or any of that stuff. And he uh, he he needs. Well, unfortunately, we need money to keep doing the work that we do. So support him in his work. And well, it's not just me. It's, it's the Canary Coalition, which is, Canary which Coalition. is uh, considerably right. more than me. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and Mountain Stream TV um, as, as well. We have a, a rally.org website. It's Mountain Stream TV. Um, and uh, I, I want to thank immensely... Uh, Adam Bigelow for coming today, and I hope you'll join us again. And Anytime. Uh, con continue to update us on, on things that you're doing in the community, in the community garden. Sure. But um, I want you to please consider that um, this is not the kind of program you're going to see if you tune into MSNBC or, uh, or any other network television news show or even a public radio show. Um, that uh, we, we intend, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep showing the work of people who are doing things in the community, activists like, mm -hmm. like Adam and, and many others. Um, and uh, it's going to take your support to keep this going. We do need money. We, and so, uh, and we, as Adam said, we do not take money and we will refuse money from uh, 
foundations that are supported by the fossil fuel industry, Duke Energy, and other entities that are a conflict of interest for the, uh, the type of act activities that we uh, are promoting. So um, mm -hmm. please consider uh, tuning into Mountain Stream TV, and um, I think that you'll uh, find that it's worth your while to do that, and uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot and be inspired, we hope. And uh, thank you all for joining us, and thank you again, Adam. You're welcome, a pleasure, and, and uh, thank you for having me out here today. And I hope to see all of you in the woods or in a garden very soon. Connect with me uh, in social media world, and I can make that happen for you. Okay. Cool. Clear. Great.